Thanks for joining us today, guys. Uh, today we are joined by Lane. Lane has a uh, fascinating story of uh, moving from the corporate world uh, into an entrepreneurial mindset, uh, and we're excited to hear his story today. So uh, as we get started here, Lane, um, you mind introducing yourself to the audience? Yeah, so my name is Lane Kawoka. I used to be an engineer. Today I own 6,000 rental properties, uh, mostly apartments, um, but started in 2009, um, bought my first rental property in Seattle, and then got that taste of cash flow and just started to chip away at it. Um, and eventually quit my day job. And yeah, hopefully we can kind of help you guys get started today. That's awesome. Yeah, excited to hear your story and what that evolution looked like. And so, you know, jumping right in, the big question we always ask our guest is, you know, when, once you reach that point where you didn't have to worry about your profitability anymore, right? You didn't have to worry about your living expenses. You didn't have to worry about putting food on the table, roof over your head. What did you start to do with your extra income uh, and how did you choose to allocate it? Well, I just bought more and more properties. I mean, I do, I, the, the worry is still there. I don't want to go back to a day job. I don't want to do that engineering job again. So I'm just going to buy more and more assets. So I'm more and more diversified and pretty assured that I don't have to go back to the job ever again. So kind of, I just target, you know, properties that are stabilized, 90% occupied or more so I can get good debt on it, not recourse debt, and maybe a little bit of value add along the way, but, you know, cash flowing properties just in case there's a hiccup in the economy. Nice. How did you start? Like what, what drove you to, you know, want to buy a property uh, and kind of when did that happen in the uh, kind of evolution for you? Was it something you knew you wanted to do right away or uh, did you try some other things first and kind of end up with purchasing property? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of grew up on this linear track. My parents taught me really frugal, um, go to school, be an engineer. And then I just started working. I had a good paying salary right out of college. So I just saved up my money to follow all the financial dogma to go buy a house to live in, which I don't necessarily think is a good idea for some people. Um, but because I was never home, I was traveling all the time for work. I decided to rent it out. And I realized, wow, I made you know, a good chunk of money, a bunch of beer money every month. And then I realized if I just did this a few more times, I'd be on the path out of this rat race. So, you know, that was kind of did it by accident. And, um, but it kind of uncovered this world of, you know, investing in real hard, tangible assets that do way better than the stock market ever could, all this 401k stuff. And um, the thing worked. It worked. Here I am, you know, shoot. <laughs> and it still works. Look yeah, it seems to be still working um, and better, you know, but, um, yeah, like none of my parents owned any rental property. My parents said, don't, you don't want to do that because your tenants will screw up your property. And you know, I didn't have any accredited investors around me to tell me what I was doing was right. It just, I just did the math. And you know, I tell people, like, just run the numbers. The numbers will tell you what to do. The numbers will tell you not to invest in the 401k or retirement nonsense. Um, the, the numbers will tell you, like, the tax advantage stuff is the real estate and the cash flow is the prudent a way to hold on to that real estate that makes sense um you mentioned that you didn't have anyone in the family that kind of you know knew or you know pushed you in this direction were there any uh, any mentors or literature that you read that you know really helped propel you and your first steps in uh in building a rental portfolio um, not really. I mean, I eventually read that rich dad, poor dad. And then by the time I read, it, I was like, well, shoot, this is all the stuff I was doing anyway. You know, I didn't have anybody need to tell me to do this, you know, like, um, I guess the only like, like models I had was like in college, like my college landlord came over to fix the toilets every once in a while. We plug it up. I mean, I kind of knew the way he was doing it was the wrong way. Like, you know, he's like the mom and Paul landlord where he doesn't have property management. He does all the repairs himself that don't work. Kind of, you know, I kind of figure like, you kind of tell when people are loaded, but you kind of also know when they're not doing it the right way. So I kind of had a sense that he wasn't super business savvy. And maybe that, that was what kind of gave me the ins where I was like, Hey, you know, it's something that anybody can do, right. That joker was doing that, you know, for us. As, as our college landlord 
Um, so, and, and you know, that was kind of the start of it. I just called up a property manager and, said, and I said, hey, you know, I'm not part of any kind of club or anything like that or certificate. A certificate. I have a house, can you rent it out? And that's how I got started. Um, and then I started to get more and more sophisticated about you know, rental value ratios, what properties you buy, you know, what EC class properties. Um, and then I kind of, because I had money, you know, I, I was really good at saving my money. I was able to save maybe 30 to 40 grand a year right out of college. And then I started to just work on the road at work. I didn't have a house. I didn't have a mortgage or rent payment. Um, so I was able to pay, put away like 60 to 100 grand a year, all to investments. So this is what really kind of put me on the path in my 20s to kind of build a portfolio. Um, just collect more and more rentals, more and more cash flow. At what point and kind of what went through your head of, uh, it sounds like you had this steady job, which uh, obviously helps with getting, you know, good debt on the properties. At what point did it make sense to kind of step away and leave that life behind? Uh, what did that kind of calculation look like for you? Yeah, well, I kind of stepped down like slowly in a different way. Like my first job that I worked with in like six, seven years was with a private company. And it like, you know, most of you guys work with private companies. It kind of sucks. It's like high stress. You get paid a little bit more, but as I became a little bit more, um, you know, more work experience, I was able to go for different jobs. Um, I started as a construction supervisor out in the field and I kind of went to the office and then I went to more government work, you know, less pay, but hell of a lot better quality of life right so there'll be days or there'll be weeks where i maybe do a few hours of work and i don't do anything else other than like you know real estate stuff like just play my spreadsheets at work um so that went along for like several years but then um you know the transition kind of happened around 2015 when i had 11 rental properties you know a lot of like had five of them in atlanta three of them in four of them in Birmingham and then one in Indy and one in Pennsylvania. And I got to a point, you know, I became more of an accredited investor at that point. And I realized that you know, the rental properties are really good to start, you know, especially when you're under half a million dollars net worth. But it, I kind of saw like the growing pains that most investors get to a point where, you know, the rental properties just aren't really scalable after a certain point. Um, with 11 properties, I maybe had an eviction every other year, some kind of big catastrophe that happened every quarter. But, you know, you have a property manager and they deal with that nonsense for you. But still, like with 11 rentals, I had maybe $3,000 of passive income a month, which is awesome. But I don't know what American family can survive off three grand a month. You know, most people I work with today, they're talking, they need about 10000 a month. So you multiply that by three and you 30 houses. So now you're talking at an exception rate of an eviction every other month. It's a kind of big catastrophe every couple of weeks at that point. And, you know, I, I'm not, I'm no dummy. I can see the writing on the wall. And I started to get around other higher net worth investors investing in private placements and syndications and multifamily apartment deals as passive investors um, where they don't put any debt in their name. You know, the, the general partnership takes care of all the management headaches. And I started to get more involved with that past 2015. And, you know, today I started to um, you know, put together deals that I own and operate myself. And that was kind of where I realized, well, it's a little irresponsible for me to kind of have a day job and take in people's money and uh, invest on their behalf and operate it. So that was the point where I finally decided to just kind of pull the plug on that engineering thing. I take it there's no regrets and uh, happy to make that change. Yeah, I mean, now that it's all like, you know, that was few years back but you know at the time it's i think we we're talking earlier there is a little bit of a identity crisis that you have i mean folks that make you know white collar salary jobs professional salaries i mean we go to school for like dozens of years and when you introduce yourself you say hi my name is lane i'm an engineer or i'm a doctor or i'm a lawyer and you don't have that thing to hang your head on right you say you're an entrepreneur and you know in the year 2021, if you call yourself an entrepreneur, or at least when I see that on anybody's LinkedIn profile, I know that the guy can't find a job and he's broke, <laughs> right? And let's be honest. So, I mean, here I am giving up a, a title of an engineer, 
I guess that's not being that special, I guess. But I don't know. I mean, you know, it's it's a little bit of a of a identity crisis. And, you know, my parents were probably wondering what the heck I was doing. You know, all this education they spent their money on. But um, but trust me, mom and dad, I'm doing fine. You know, the, the rental properties are doing pretty well. Don't have to worry about me. I'm not gonna go move in with you guys anytime soon. I'll just gonna, go one and two of these six thousand apartments. Right, <laughs> you've got a you've got a couple other doors available to you to go use. Yeah, maybe I I probably won't live in half of them. I guess you know, but some of them I would. You know, nice. Some of the nicer ones. What uh, you were talking about this identity crisis? Kind of what have you done to kind of overcome that, or you know, come to grips, or is it something you're still wrestling with today? <laughs> Yeah, I just go buy a nice car and I just suck it up. You know, I just got to get over it. No, I mean, that's part of it, right? But I mean, I don't, I don't go to a day job anymore. I don't have a boss. I kind of work for myself. And I guess the, the clients are, are kind of the, the boss nowadays, which, you know, people who are business owners can probably relate to, which is either better or worse. But I mean, you're always going to be working at something. You know, but I think when you're working a salary, like, you know, the reason why they're paying you at that job is that you're bringing in more revenue and income or value than what they're paying you in a salary. If not, I don't know what kind of stupid company that is, right? That's just not a good financial decision. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's for a lot of real estate investors and I've met a lot of passive investors along this journey and I keep them in my database I mean, it's a lot of this passive real estate investing on the side is done sort of secretively, right? I mean, well, I had a, this one lady at work. She said, like, she she heard me talking about like doing something in my properties. And she's like, hey, do you have a few rental properties? You know? Oh shoot, you haven't heard about the other thousand? You know, like, you know, like people. Some people think that like. You know, if you have one rental property, you know, you, your, your attention is elsewhere, right? Depends if you're like a house flipper or like you're flip, a wholesaler. Yeah, that stuff is like very active, right? But if you're a passive real estate investor, a lot of this can be done on the side and it should be, right? I mean, you should be minding your business, which is your personal finances. Your job is just one way to get money, right? But where is your really, your, the rubber meets the road? And this is goes into the whole thing where it's like people should put their time and energy into what really matters, right? Your, what really matters is your family and your investments that power the money to go to your family. That's interesting. So the job and the rental portfolio and all of that is just a vehicle to get to the end. Uh, whatever family for you, it sounds like is, you know, one of the most important pieces. In my opinion, I mean, I think it, you, you start to build this in buckets, right? You, you got You need money. I mean, this world operates on money. Money gives you freedom. Until you have freedom, do you have the time flexibility to kind of do what you want and spend it who you want, where you want, and on your terms? Um, I don't, maybe that's just how I view life, right? I mean, some people are able to blend and get all this stuff done at, at one time, but to me, you know, you start off working, you need money to invest in real estate. This is real estate investing. You need money to invest. If you don't have money, you got you gotta if you can't invest, you have a money problem. I mean, there's so many people in this world that are really bad with their finances. And it's one of two problems. Either they have a hole in their budget and they need to fix that. Luckily, I was just lucky enough to, you know, have the good financial habits right off the bat. Um but then the other thing is, well, you need to have a good salary. And if you don't have a means to make money, then it doesn't matter how good of a saver you are, right? If you don't make more than fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year, you got to find a way to make money. And you know, I know you're not a huge fan of college like how I am, but college allows regular people to get paid higher than average salaries. So it is what it is. Yeah, I wouldn't uh I have a very close affinity with the educational system as well um, in terms of it was very important for uh, for me with my family growing up, right? And that was seen as the identity, right? It was going to a good school, showing that you, you know, graduated and got the good job. And so 
there's definitely tons of value that I see there, um, you know, as long as what you said, and it, it creates a working class that the country operates under, right? Um, particularly in a service driven economy, which the US is, uh, the skills, a lot of the skills and the relationships that you learn through college help you be successful there, um, right. which I think right. is critical to, you know, the path forward. And, you know, for you and I, it's critical for people who have a good job, who can go buy real estate or go rent real estate, which then fuels our businesses as well. Right. So, um, I think that part is, it, it's an integral part of the equation for sure. Right. Um, you talked a little bit about the evolution from single family home into multifamily. And it sounds like uh, you went from, you know, being a partner to then running the deals on your own. Um, you know, how, how did you find those deals and how did you make that flip from, you know, I'm going to go own the, you know, the smaller house uh, and you know, the 10 houses to 30. And instead of doing that, I'm going to go on a, a portion of a multifamily. Um, you know, how did, how did you identify that and kind of how did you get down that path? Yeah, I mean, we just, I mean, we just skip right over, we didn't do any duplex or triplex or quads. I mean, we just skip right to 40 units and greater because what we discovered, I mean, we, we were looking at like in the beginning, me and my partners, we didn't trust anybody. Because most people don't, right? <laughs> That's just how you are when you start out. You don't trust a single soul other than yourself. But, you know, we were looking at these smaller properties, you know, these 10, 20, 30 units. And you, you start to realize that there's this kind of pecking order in properties there's like there's like this rung of like properties under maybe a few million dollars purchase price where it's available to mom and pop investors and mom and pop investors you want to get the hell away from because they're they're unsophisticated and they bid up properties so if you can get a, a rung higher than that you're better off and not only that but you have better economies of scale right right around 50 60 units you can sort of justify an in-house property manager to sit at your properties at all times but I'll say like we try and do today, we try and get, definitely get over a hundred something units because there, there we can have the, the guy running around the golf cart, the handyman or taking out little plumbing repairs, not on third party repairs where you get gouged, but in-house staff. Uh, we train our guys with the HVAC, you know, so we don't have to pay third party with that to take out care of those little HVAC issues. Um, that, at that unit count, that's where you really start to get the economies of scale. And then from the lending perspective, now that's where you really start to get the bigger, um, the more bigger Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, not recourse debt. That's kind of the gold standard in our, our industry. Um, so it kind of took me about a year to figure that out. You know, just underwriting 20, 40 unit properties and banging my head against the wall that they're overpriced and the deals wouldn't work. Um, but then, you know, that's kind of where we, when I finally got smart, you know, we had to go through the bigger properties and kind of syndicate from passive investors and do that that type of stuff. So it sounds like you jumped from single units where you own the whole process to you made a transformation to uh, 40 plus units, higher bite size. You went and found other accredited investors who came in as uh, you know LPs or passive guys under your structure and you and your partner kind of ran it from there. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, operations is one thing, but the biggest thing is getting the good deal. I mean, it starts with the deal. Um, and this is what's, what's hard. I mean, like a lot of people go to these guru groups and they try and get trained up, but 95% of them just strike out and fail because the brokers are presented with all these like newbies and none of these newbies have ever closed anything. So from their perspective, it's like, which sucker can close one of these properties and get the loan? Right, because you need to get the Fannie Mae Freddie Mac card to get these larger deals in the first place. So it's it's quite the chicken the egg type of quantum here. Um, so you know it just took us a while to kind of break in, build those relationships, and then you know we kind of started with a bunch of crappy Class C properties under sixty units. Um, did that. Uh, we eventually we recently sold a lot of those, and then kind of moved up, swam upstream to more B class, one hundred fifty units and above. Um, it's kind of the, the target practice today. Um, again, the idea is to stay above mom and pop investors, above 20, 30 units, and then but below like the institutional players, you know, investing people's lazy retirement money. And all they got to do is hit like, you know, 5% or something lame like that, right? Like those guys are just, they just need to deploy money to get, you know, acquisition fees and assets under management. So there's a nice little void to try and stay between 
like just underneath the big guys, but under over the the mom and pop festers. Um, as you look back, would you do anything differently? Uh, no, I would not. I would go to school. I would get my good salary, and I would save even more money to put to single family home rentals, build up my portfolio to become a credit investor, and then invest as quickly as I possible, just like how I did. So no regrets, right? Like the tattoo, people's chest, no regrets. So it sounds like the, the path in your mind is go and get accredited. Once you're accredited, surround yourself with other uh, accredited passive investors, syndicate to date together, get above the mon pa, below the institutional, find that sweet spot. You can essentially do the economies of scale is the big driver, it sounds like, in doing everything in-house, building that knowledge and expertise, and then rinse, repeat, and find, find the good deals uh, yeah. to do that again. Yeah. I mean, another reason why to do that too is, you know, a lot of like broke guys, younger guys, they always have this like make, you know, go big or go home idea, right? They're just going to go buy big multifamily, which I think is really silly and doesn't work really. Um, you can't just go find a hundred unit property and buy it. It just doesn't work like that. And plus you need the experience, right? Like, especially if you're a passive investor, right? Like anybody can put together a syndication deal. You, you know, you just make a podcast, put together a fake book and you're off and rolling, right? You know, you make a pitch deck, you go hire somebody on Upwork, right? Pay them 20 bucks an hour to make you this cool PowerPoint presentation. You get some Zoom, right? Everybody uses Zoom these days and you're off and rolling. So really the only way to determine who to invest with is like, you know, if you if you can underwrite deals, that's fine. That's one thing. But most passive investors don't have a clue how to underwrite, you know, these deals. The only way, in my opinion, is going off like referrals off a trusted uh, peer group of other accredited, peer passive accredited investors. The only way to do that is to add value to peer passive accredited investors and for yourself to be up to snuff with them, right? Which means possibly buying a rental or two, right? Um, you know, and getting in the right rooms with the right people. So the, the first phase is all about the training ground, essentially, uh, getting the knowledge up to speed and taking your bumps and understanding why things are a certain way uh, to better prepare you to not get laughed out of the room for the people that you ultimately need to, to partner with to, to grow the business. Right, right. I mean, one of the first syndication deals I went to, I lost all my money because I just went off a random referral of somebody I didn't know. You know, I mean ideally the gold standard is to build a relationship with another credit investor that has no, you know, bearing on the outcome, whether you invest or not, that, that you've built up that organic relationship with them, that you trust them and they trust you. And you ask them, well, who are you investing with? What has worked with in the past? You know, that's kind of the gold standard. There's obviously a little bit of a leap right there, but it's better than just blindly investing with somebody. Um, I, in, on the other hand, like kind of went off a referral, but that person who gave me the referral doesn't even invest, I don't, you know, now it's kind of funny and I laugh at it, you know, what the hell was I doing listening to this joker, right? But I didn't know any better, right? And a lot of passive investors are clueless too about this stuff if you're coming into this, you know, this syndication private placement world yourself. That makes sense. What is, what's the most exciting thing that you're working on or, you know, takes your attention today that you get jazzed up when you wake up in the morning? The, the most exciting thing is how boring what we do. It's super boring. Uh, we have a saying like, you know, boring investments, fun life. Um, I still think my life is kind of boring. Um, trying to, you know, just picking up another property that cash flows is like, with a little bit of value add is kind of like picking up a lemonade stand that has, you know, a long client list and the ability to make the lemonade a little bit better and selling it for a little bit more. I mean, it's not, a, you're not going to get rich overnight, but over time, I mean, you know, I, I think this is going to grow your money prudently, but more importantly, like preserve your capital should anything happen in the economy. I mean, just look what happened to the pandemic I mean, with over 5,000 rentals at the time. I mean, our collections pretty much stayed the same. I mean, I've never been through a pandemic before. I mean, I was a little worried, but April, March of 2020, I mean, 
collections maybe dip down a couple percent points overall, but you know, I think we show the resiliency of this asset class, you know, workforce housing, something that that lower middle class needs. And it's something that they're not making more of. And it's a growing demand for this type of you know, commodity. It seems to work. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's not rocket science, right? It's funny that you're excited about the boring, right? Yeah, Because the boring is what works. Yeah. I mean, if you look at like, you know, there's a saying like wealth whispers. The things that the wealthy families do as I start to uncover like these big family offices, the things that they invest in and their involvement are very boring commodity type of services. And it's the, it's the startups, it's the Deutschcoin and all these like sexy things. These are just what the kids are involved with or the guys who get lucky, which are the nouveau, nouveau money are into. Um, I mean, that's just kind of something I've done over time. It's just, I follow what the, what the wealth building strategies of the wealthy do and I just try and emulate it, right? And that's what I realized is a lot of these things that these rich people do are very accessible that to the normal person, but very counterintuitive to what we're all taught. Right? Yeah, key insight there, right? That uh, what the wealthy do is usually the opposite of what we're taught along the right. way. Like, like um, we don't do 401k. We don't do 401ks, right? Like none of us, like I don't, I'm not a big proponent for 401ks or reti any retirement funds, even Roths. Like I want to pay my taxes today, get it out of that system while well, my tax bracket is lower today. Because all indications say that taxes are going to be going up in the future. Plus, I'm going to make a lot more money in the future in a higher tax bracket. Um, I don't want to wait till I'm 65, 70 years old to get my money. But the big thing is like through these larger deals, we can do cost segregations, extract a lot of bonus depreciation and show a huge um, passive loss um, bolus in the beginning. And this is what allows a lot of clients to play different games on their taxes, right? So like if you have a doctor making 600 grand a year, you do real estate professional status. There's a lot of jumps, uh, hoops to jump through for that, but you know you can use the passive losses to lower yourself down to maybe three hundred thousand, effectively saving you one hundred fifty thousand dollars of taxes right there. And if you're investing through a retirement account, you don't get any of those passive activity losses to play these types of games. So, I mean, can you tell me any good reason to invest in a retirement account? <laughs> Not really. I mean, so the only reason I do is because I make mine a self-directed. And there's a company matching portion, right? So it's a way for me to, uh, yeah, it's another tax shield of a tax shield, right? Uh, to implement, but the general concepts of what you're articulating, I align with, right? Yeah. I, I'm going to make more money in the future than I am now. Taxes will likely increase, or loopholes will go away. That like uh, yeah. I'm happy to pay it now I, and have it. Free. I mean, I'm cool. With, I'm cool with that, right? Like that's free money, and I guess you should take it, but like. You know, the people like after that, I mean, there's really no reason to do it, right? You take the money out of it and, and invest cash. Um, right. A lot of people will say, well, I don't want to do, you know, supposedly the retirement system is tax free. Well, it does go tax free, but if you're investing in real estate, the best tax advantage thing out there, it should be tax free anyway. So that negates that whole argument. And then the other thing is, um, you know, like your, your 401k, like there's a, there's, if you take it out of that, retirement funds you get a penalty supposedly right you know good little boys and girls who stay at their day jobs work their jobs you know like the term penalty right nobody wants a penalty but you know i i call it the ticket to get it out of the garbage investment world right and get into decent stuff um 10 you know, percent. i mean most people recoup that in a year or two at most very cool. I appreciate uh, you sharing some of your insights and a bit of your journey, Lane. Um, what's the best way for our listeners to be able to connect with you? Yeah, um, I would say check out my podcast, simplepassivecashflow.com um, is the website. I think the podcast is Simple Passive Cashflow Passive Investing, I think. Um, but if not, my email address is lane at simplepassivecashflow.com. Very cool. Well, thank you for joining us today, Lane. Uh, definitely appreciate it and uh, look forward to staying in communication.